John chapter 17. This is the Lord's Prayer. Every once in a while we need to review it. That which is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, of course, is not the Lord's Prayer. It is the model prayer. This is really the Lord's Prayer. It was done before he went to Gethsemane. And uh, well, let's look back into the verse, uh, chapter 16. Jesus answers him in verse 31. John 16, 31. Do you now believe, he says. Behold, the hour cometh, and yea, now is come, that there shall be, ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have what? Tribulation. That's promise. You want to mark that in your margin? Promise. Jesus made That's one of those precious promises. In the world. Oh, you don't think it's so precious. Huh? Well, it's a promise anyway. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the world, we're going to have tribulation. There are going to be problems. You say, oh, I thought when I got my life all straightened out with the Lord, I wouldn't have any more problems. Yeah, you'll have problems. You'll just be able to overcome because of the power of Jesus. That's the difference. In the world, we'll have tribulation, but we're to be of good cheer. We're not to become despondent, sad, miserable, rejected because of this. Oh, me, I'm covered up with problems. But rather to be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. And because he has overcome the world, then we can become overcomers by identifying with him and his finished work, by understanding the principles on which Jesus' life worked. We follow the same principles. He did all of these things. You know, Jesus didn't practice what he preached. He preached what he practiced. He did it and said, now see, that's the way you do it. And so as we study the word and the study of the life of Jesus in particular and the principles in God's word, we will learn how to put principles that are in the word into effect, which will help us overcome the things in our lives that are troublesome. Now this isn't easy. It's not very popular either. You're supposed to, you know, say it's hip to do and hallelujah all the way to glory. Clap your hands and be joyful and skip and hop and jump benches now and then. Well that may be all right. But there are times when you don't feel like skipping and hopping. There are times when you don't feel like clapping your hands. There are times when you sure don't feel like shouting hallelujah, do you? You may shout, you may shout hallelujah. And you may feel like you've lost your last friend, but that's all right. We are to latch on to the principles that the Lord has taught us in order to overcome the world. He went through the world victorious, didn't he? And he is the pattern. He's the one we're to pattern after. These words spake Jesus, John 17, 1, and lifted up his eyes unto heaven and said, here is, he begins his prayer, Father, the hour is now come glorify thy son. Now many times before he had said mine hour is not yet come. A number of times once they came to throw him off a cliff they loved him so well. And he said mine hour is not come. He went through him just like a knife cutting through hot butter. They couldn't find him. Another time they came they were going to grab him and make a king out of him. He said mine hour is not yet come. And he vanished through the crowd and they couldn't find him. Several times he said mine hour is not yet come. Now he comes to the Father, and he said, Father, the hour has come. It's time. Jesus was not walking in ignorance. He was not a victim of God's will. He was a victor through God's will. Now to the world, it looks like he's a victim. He's caught in a dreadful trap. But actually, Jesus deliberately turned and walked into Jerusalem at the worst possible time when his enemies were at, the, at their most powerful zenith, you might say. He deliberately walked in there. <laughs> wow. And stay out. All right. <laughs> he deliberately turned and walked into Jerusalem. And it was the worst possible time to go. His enemies were there. They were very strong. And he was walking right into a trap. And yet it was by deliberate foreknowledge he went into the city. 
because he was to be the Passover. And he had to go at a definite appointed time. Now keep in mind that the devil was not aware of these things. We sometimes fall into the era of believing that Satan is all-knowing. He's omniscient. That is, he knows everything. This isn't true. He knows much more than we do to the point that we think, well, he must know everything, but he doesn't. He's not all-knowing, and there are a lot of blind spots that he has. One of them was concerning Jesus. He did not know much of what you and I understand in the Scriptures. He still doesn't. There are things in Scripture that you and I appropriate that Satan and his angels cannot grasp or understand. They can say it, but they don't, they don't see what it means. Because these things are spiritually understood. And the devil has been blocked, and his angels have been blocked from certain areas. Does that make you feel a little better? They're smarter than we are, but they're not smarter than God. And God has always outmaneuvered them. And his son turned by deliberate intent and purpose of the Father to walk into the city. And he raises his eyes and says, Father, my now the hour has come. He said, Glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. Here's a lesson to learn. When you want God to glorify, to lift you up, it must be for right motives in order that the Father may be glorified in the Son. As thou hast given him, the Son, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Wow. What a tremendous thing that the Father gave to the Son. He gave the Son power to give eternal life to, how, to who? As many as the Father had given to him. Did you know you're a love gift from the Father to the Son? He has chosen you and given you to the Son as a love gift. And this is life eternal. What does it mean to have eternal life? That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You have to know the Father and the Son to have eternal life. Jesus said, I have glorified thee on the earth. Here's the pattern son again. We are to glorify the Father on the earth. Uh, we like to think about going to heaven. I do, don't you? Oh, it's going to be wonderful up there, you know, and everything. And we're just going to glorify Jesus. We're going to shout hallelujah, and we're just going to have a good time. I believe that. But he says, I have glorified thee down here on the old nasty earth. Where it's not so much fun all the time. For in this world you shall have tribulation, but you're still able to glorify the Son, Son uh, the glorify the Father. He said, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. We need to find out what God has in mind for us to do and do it. Finish that work that he's given us done. I've glorified you on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Are you aware that Jesus Christ was always with the Father? From eternity past, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were together. And that when Jesus came to be born of a virgin, he stripped himself. The Greek says it was a, the kenosis. He, he laid aside all his trappings of glory. He had to lay aside his glory. If the Son had shown up down here, the way he is in heaven, he would have blinded everybody. He laid aside his glory. He laid aside all his prerequisites as a son and came to be born in the womb of the Virgin Mary as a tiny babe who looked like an ordinary person. He didn't even have light coming out of his head. He didn't have a little circle over his head saying, Jesus is here. He didn't have his heart hanging out with thorns in it. He looked for all the world like a normal baby boy. He grew up, he looked like other teenage boys. He grew up and he was just an ordinary looking man. Because he laid aside his glory 
and left it behind, stripped himself to come and be identified with man in order to become the savior of man. You say, when did he know that he was the son of God? No, that's not hard. The Bible tells us in the Psalms, while he nursed on his mother's breast, he knew he was the son of God. That's pretty young. It didn't just come and hit him all of a sudden one day. Hey, guess what? You're the son of God. That knowledge was always with him. And yet he didn't count it as something to be exploited. He didn't count it as something to strut around about. He had a stepfather named Joseph who was a carpenter. And he worked at manual labor. Long hours of hard work. And he was an unusual person. Everybody, I think, recognized he was unusual. But nobody mentions him that much. From the time he was 12 years old, when he was in the temple and astounded all the teachers of the law, he already knew all that. He came out, you realize that when they took him into the temple, and he got separated from the bunch that time, and he, they came back and he was talking to all the rabbis, the learned rabbis and everything, he had them on the ropes. They were asking him questions. He was answering them. And then he was asking them questions they couldn't answer. You see, he knew the word of God. And they were astonished that a 12-year-old boy could know this. And then he drops completely out of sight. We don't hear a word out of him until he's about 33 years old. Now, I know you can read, you know, the, the life of Jesus, the uh, teenager, the life of Jesus where he... When he was a little boy, you know, he took the little bird with a broken wing and he touched it and he healed it and, and he uh, got the butterfly to fly again and all kinds of lovely little blubbers. Jesus, whatever he was doing growing up, God counted it of no particular consequence and he left no record of it. So don't go read somebody's foolish rambling trying to tell you what they think that Jesus might have done. How ridiculous. The thing that was glorious was when he was 33 years old, or 30 years old, he emerged suddenly. He came out. It was time for the ministry. And for three years, he did what no one had ever done in all the world before. And he startled and staggered a whole generation of people and he frightened the daylights out of the demonic host everywhere he went. He met them in open conflict and battle and defeated them everywhere. And yet he had left his glory behind. And you remember that the demons knew him. When he first stood up in the synagogue to read the scripture, he just read that scripture right back there on the wall. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and so forth. He started reading that scripture. And a demon screamed out at him, we know who you are. They recognized him. The people didn't know who he was. They thought, oh, yeah, that's the son of Joseph the carpenter down there. But the demons knew exactly who he was. And he made them hush because they were telling things ahead of time. It wasn't time for him to be revealed. And yet he had laid aside his glory. And yet he was still so powerful. He shook the demonic world and shook the kingdom of darkness. And they had to back up and retreat, and wholesale retreat everywhere he went. He said, I glorify thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. This was after three years of faithfully doing what God the Father had given him to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory I had with thee before the world was. He said, I'm ready now to come back and receive back all that that I laid aside. Now, nobody has ever seen Jesus Christ. All these artist pictures are pure garbage. If you have any of them, I advise you to throw them away. Because if you have a picture of Jesus around us, oh, it reminds me of Jesus. Well, nobody knows what he looks like. He certainly didn't have long shoulder length hair because the Bible says men shouldn't wear long hair. And he certainly wouldn't write one thing to another. There's a lot of things wrong with those pictures. Mainly because God deliberately didn't leave a picture of him. Are you aware that, Jesus, that the Lord had quite, was quite capable of leaving a picture if he wanted a picture of his son? 
You know why he didn't? I can give you some educated guesses. One reason, because everybody would say, do I look like him? <laughs> People are that stupid and they're foolish, you know. They'd think somehow they had an edge if they just kind of looked like it. Am I about the same size he was? God deliberately left all that blank. He didn't want us wrapped up in a bunch of inconsequential details that don't really matter. He wanted us to do what Jesus told that Samaritan woman, worship God in spirit and in truth. Get away from your pictures and your crosses and your religious doodads. If you need those to worship with, you're in trouble. A lot of people say, well, I love to go into the sanctuary. And I gaze at the beautiful crosses on the altar. And I love to see the candles flickering. Well, I always heard that you drag the candles out when the power goes off. That's what we do around here. We got some candles. We use them every time the lights go out. But when you need religious props, to get you in a religious mood, you're dealing with religious spirits. Friend, we're talking about reality, spiritual, supernatural reality that is not demonic. We're talking about the living Lord. And God deliberately didn't let us see a lot of these things. And I have to emphasize to you that Jesus doesn't look like any of the pictures you've ever seen or any of the statues you've ever seen. Mary didn't look like any of the ones you've seen either. And they certainly didn't have a little circle of halo of light over their heads. No way. You know where that circle of light came from? The Babylonian idolatry system. That was part of the Babylon mystery religion years ago that God destroyed. And that light around the head indicates the sun god, Lucifer. And every time you see a halo over somebody's head, he said, oh, oh, well, there's one of those. Every time you see a steeple on a church, you can mark it down that that's a phallic symbol, a symbol of the worship of the male sex organ. That's what that is. That's all that it is. There's no earthly reason to have a steeple on the church. But it's a carryover from the old Babylonian demonic system. And every time you drive down the street and see the steeple, you say, oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they worship, they know not what. <laughs> now, if you're visiting, you go to a church that has a steeple, please don't go out there and start sawing it off. You're liable to get in trouble. I have to warn you that many people are not aware of this. And even if they are, they won't accept it because that steeple costs too much money. It's absolutely unreal the fantastic job the devil has done to sell us all kinds of demonic gadgets to hang around us that really glorify him. And he snickers up his sleeve at us every time we have those things. There are all kinds of... Don't get me started on that. There's all kinds of religious doodads that ought to be put in the fire. You don't need religious things. We like to have scripture on our walls. We don't need some saint thing reaching out to us from the stained glass window. Hmm? I've been in those churches. I felt like spooky. You can see them over there. One of them was, was uh, pouring water on Jesus' head. They were doing all kinds of strange things. And they're all looking so saintly. You know? with little circles around their heads and everything. It's enough to make you want to throw up. All of that stuff is just religious garbage. I'll tell you what, we need to get back to the reality of worshiping Jesus in spirit and in truth. We need to be able to worship him in our cars. We need to be able to worship him as we walk down the street as we're at our jobs and our homes. We need to be able to relate to him wherever we are whatever we're doing that's what we need well he's asking the father to restore to him that which he laid aside he's coming home 
He's going to finish the work. When he does, he's asking the Father to restore the glory that he laid aside before the world was. The glory that he had before the world was. He's asking for this to be restored. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Manifest means to show openly or plainly. He said, I have manifested thy name to the men that you gave me out of the world. God called some men to him out of the world. He called 11, the devil volunteered one. Remember Jesus said, haven't I called 12 and one of you is the devil, a demon? If the perfect leader had one in 12 that was a demon, that uh, wouldn't be surprising if we find one in our bunch every once in a while, would it? Mm -hmm. And he said, thine they were these men that you called out of the world, thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Jesus had done a good job. He had instructed them in the word. He said, they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. He said, I have taught them well, that everything I have taught them has come from you. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. He's, he's laid the foundation well. I pray for them. Who is he praying for? These men that God has given him out of the world. I pray not for the world. Now this is a significant statement. He's not praying for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, thine are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Now Jesus said, I do not pray for the world. I'm praying for those that you have given me, Father. Do you remember, I believe it's over in Romans, it talks about the prayer ministry of the Holy Spirit. Do you know who he's praying for? He intercedes for us who are believers with groanings that cannot be uttered. The prayer ministry of the Holy Spirit is taken up in praying for believers. Jesus said, I'm praying for believers. The Holy Spirit says, I'm praying for believers. Who's going to pray for the unsaved? Who does that leave? That's us. You and I are left with the privilege of praying for the un unsaved. Don't ever let the devil tell you it doesn't do any good to pray for your unsaved loved ones and friends. Jesus' prayer ministry is taken up praying for you and me. The Holy Spirit's prayer ministry is taken up praying for you and me. And he has left to us the field of praying for the unsaved. Praying that they'll come to the Lord. And he said, now I'm no more in the world. But these are in the world. He's looking ahead. He said, I'm not going to be down here in the world anymore. But these that I've called are still in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father. And notice what he prays. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And notice what he prays. He is praying for the Father to keep those that the Father has given to him. Do you think he gets his prayers answered? think the son knows how to pray and get an answer right? You bet he does. And he gets his prayer answered, and God is busily keeping those whom he has given to the son. This prayer is still effective. That they may be one as we are. He wasn't talking about a giant super church. He's talking about one in spirit. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are one in spirit. They're together. And he says, I want you to keep my believers like that. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. He said, I was their mainstay while I was in the world. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but which one? The son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, there's only one that didn't make it. Judas was in the bunch, but not of it. You know you can be in the church, not of it? You know, you can be starched and iron but never washed. 
That's the way Judas was. He was in the bunch. He was a member in good standing. He had been baptized. He went out on the missionary trips. He preached. He prayed. He did everything the others did. But he never did touch base with the Lord. He even was elected to be the treasurer. Now you have to have a pretty honest person or somebody that everybody thinks well of to be the treasurer, don't you? And it says there's only one of them that was a son of perdition that never was saved at all. No, Judas never was saved. Jesus was the only one that knew it. And yet he never did treat Judas any differently than he did the others. And Judas never did know until those final closing hours for sure that Jesus knew. I think he suspected it every once in a while. Jesus would make a remark and I think Judas would look at him and be aiming that at me. And Jesus didn't say anything. He just said, no, he, he couldn't know. He couldn't know. But right at the Lord's Supper, you remember? That last supper? When Judas said, is it I? Jesus handed him the sop. And he'd said, the one I hand the sop to, that's him. And those disciples didn't even see that. Didn't register. And Judas knew. And Jesus looked at him and said, that which thou doest do quickly. And murderous hatred entered into Judas. He said, you knew. You knew all the time. And he went out to betray him. Now, he said, now I come to thee. Well, he said, none of them is lost, except the son of perdition of the scripture might be fulfilled. The scripture said that this was going to happen. Now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. The Lord wants to do something inside of you. His joy fulfilled within yourself. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. He said, when I gave them your word, it separated them from the world. And they were not of the world, and the world hated them because of this. The world hates somebody different, or had you noticed that? I mean, when you got saved, when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you began to receive deliverance, did you ever notice that the world somehow takes a special aversion to you? A lot of times you first notice it in your relatives. What's the matter with them? You'll notice it at work. You'll notice it among friends or ex-friends. One of the nice things about getting into deliverance is that whereas before you might have been very busy with your social life, had so many engagements it was hard for you to keep up with everything, when you get into deliverance you lose most of your friends so you don't really have that much to do anymore. So you can concentrate on the main things. That helps you. Because then you have time to read the Bible because there's nobody calling anymore. And nobody stops by. And they just assume you don't stop by either. And uh, so it, you know, it helps you a good deal. He said, Now I pray that thou shouldst, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world. Sometimes, you know, do you say, oh, Lord, just take me out of this old wicked world. So holy, righteous. And everybody around me is not. But Jesus didn't pray you'd be taken out. If you're really that good, you need to stay. He said, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil, and I believe I recall correctly, this, the Greek says the evil one. He said, I want to keep you from the evil one right here in the wicked world. Not take you out. That's what we like to do. It? We're just going to get on the train and go to heaven. And <laughs> bye-bye cruel world, you know. Forget it. I don't have to worry with you anymore. No more trials. No more temptations. Hallelujah, I'm through with this mess. And the Lord said, no, stay. 
We're like the gathering demoniac, you know. We get to meet the Lord. We have a blessing from the Lord. And uh, these people all around us come around and say, please leave our shores. We wish you'd, we don't want that kind. Would you please just leave? We don't like that kind of preaching. We don't want that kind of church in our neighborhood. And you're just like, you and I just like the gathering. When Jesus and his disciples get on the boat, we get on too. He said, what are you doing? Well, I'm going with you. I am not stay here. He said, no, you have to stay here. But Lord, I don't want to stay here. Look what they're saying. They say, get out. I'm the only one. He said, yeah, see, you're one. Isn't that great? I got one here. Yes. She don't think it's very great at the time. But Jesus gave him a commission, said, go and tell everyone what the Lord has done for thee. And a few months later, Jesus comes back, and this man has done his job. This time, instead of asking him not to come, the people throng out to hear him. They want to hear this one who made such a drastic change in the demoniac's life. So Jesus is not praying that God will take us out of the world, but rather to keep us in the world. And keep us from the evil one. He said, these of mine are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. He said, they are not of the world. We're citizens of another world. We're aliens here on the earth. Now he says, sanctify, which means set apart, set them apart through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How are you going to be set apart in this wicked world and kept against the powers of darkness from the evil one by being set apart by the word of God. The word of God has the power not only to get us saved but to grow us up in knowledge and strength and power and to guide us into all the gifts of the spirit and other things that God has ordained that we would use to defeat the forces of darkness. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. In other words, the same commission that was given to, uh, by the Father to the Son is given by the Son to us, his disciples. He said, Father, you sent me into the world to carry the good news. I have also sent them the same way. And for their sakes... I sanctify or set apart myself that they also might be sanctified or set apart through truth. Jesus said, I set myself apart in order that they be set apart by the word. Neither pray I for these alone. Oh, here's where we get on the boat. He's praying for those he had right then. But he said, I don't pray for just these alone, Father, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. You remember how you came to believe? You believe because of something Matthew wrote, something Mark wrote, something Luke wrote, something John wrote, something Paul wrote, something Peter wrote, the plan of salvation. You see, you believe because of their word. And Jesus is praying for us who have believed because of their word. He said, I pray for them which shall believe on me through their word. I believed on Jesus because of the word of this early group that he sanctified in truth. They wrote down the precious word of God. And because they gave the plan of salvation, I and hundreds of thousands of others have believed because of their word and Jesus uh, says I pray for them too he's praying for us isn't that encouraging now what does he pray that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee that they may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me now this does not mean one big super church these verses have been twisted to say well you see we're supposed to all get in one big bud no, this is strictly a spiritual affair. It's that the believers might be one in spirit. Haven't you gone someplace and you met a believer who was also a believer in Jesus Christ and was filled with the things of the Lord 
and you just felt like you'd known them forever, even though you just met and you felt a kinship for them. That's oneness. That's being one with another believer. And it's not because you belong to, your, their church may have a different name than your church. Their background may be totally different. Their social economic orientation may be totally different. Their racial national uh, background may be totally different. But there's a oneness that comes because of the same spirit that's working within you. Hmm? Now that's the oneness he's talking about. And God isn't particularly interested with these colossal machines of hooking things together and organizing and planning and getting everybody to walk the same way and everybody to walk in a little line and go quack, 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 quack at the same time. That's not what God has in mind. He has in mind of a group of believers and from diverse origins and backgrounds and everything else, personalities and all, and yet because they're centered in on the Son, they're worshiping the Father through the Son, and the Holy Spirit is quickening them, that when they come together, they feel a sense of unity with these other believers. They don't feel any sense that they need to boss them, rule over them, or hold them, or anything else. They just feel a, a, a oneness with them. And that's what he's talking about. I am them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, has loved them as thou hast loved me. He said this will be the witness of the working out of what we purposed in the beginning. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. He's still talking about us. Did the Father give you the Son? And he's talking about you. He's saying, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Now, where is he? Anybody know where Jesus is? He's at the right hand of the Father. You know what he's doing? Well, he was the prophet down here. He's now the great high priest. And he is the soon coming king. Right now he's the high priest at the right hand of the Father interceding for those who believe. Remember, he's praying for those who have believed. And he's at the right hand of the Father. Now he said, I want them to be where I am. That's nice. He's not going to leave us forever down here on the earth. There's coming a time. He said, Father, I, I want them, those you've given me, I want them to be with me where I am that they may behold my glory. He said, they're going to get to see me as I really am. The glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. He said, I want to share with them the glory that you've given to me. I want them to see it. I want them to witness it. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. And what he's simply saying is that there's a unity coming about in the believers promoted by the inner experience, not by an outer organization. And this similar experience is being born again, filled with the Spirit, and locked in place with the common worship of the Father through the Son. That's where the unity comes. And when you get to thinking about it, that's the only way unity can really come, isn't it? There are too many differences, there are too many variables for people ever to be able to get along together unless there's a unifying factor. The unifying factor is Jesus Christ and his prayer that the Father certainly is answering. And what a blessing it is to know that he prayed for us long ago. He didn't leave us out. He said, I'll pray for them that shall believe because of their word. Aren't you glad that they spoke up? I'm so glad that I heard the word, aren't you? I'm glad that somebody shared with me that Jesus loved me. I'm glad that somebody preached and preached against church membership and for Jesus Christ because I was sliding hell from a church pew. It took a Baptist preacher taking my church membership, chopping it into the kindling and throwing it into hell fire in a sermon to scare the daylights out of me. I was perfectly comfortable. I'd joined the church. I'd gone through all the approved things. And when I went to hear this preacher preach, I thought, yeah, well, that's good, you know. 
and be nice if these people that are lost would go forward and get saved. It must be terrible to be lost. Of course, I'm all right. I'm a member. I wasn't a member of that church, but I was a member. And then one day he just acted ugly. And he tore into church membership, and when he got through, there wasn't anything left of it. Church membership wasn't worth anything as far as getting to heaven was concerned. And I felt terrible. When I'd been going to church all my life, and I knew that you were supposed to feel good when you went to church. You weren't supposed to feel bad. And going to church made you feel better. So that man couldn't be doing right. Because I felt terrible. And I decided I'd go back to my church again. They didn't make you feel bad over there. They told you how nice it was because you were members, you see. And uh, I knew that man couldn't be doing good and making me feel as terrible as I did. But, of course, I've mentioned before, I couldn't get away from that little church meeting in the schoolhouse. I'd just find my feet walking right back in there, and I didn't want to go. And here I came, just walking right in. I thought, now, what am I doing here? And they'd preach again, and I'd feel worse. Every time I went, I felt worse. I just, it just got worse and worse. I felt terrible. And I'd always felt real good about going to church. I thought it was real interesting and nice and, and, put, and everything. And, and after, but after he tore up my church membership, I was very miserable. If I didn't know then what was happening. I was under conviction. And those hypocritical Baptists just smile at me. So glad to see you. I didn't know they were praying for me. I didn't need prayer. You know, I was all right. But thank God they did keep praying. And uh, the Lord got to me. And I gave my heart to the Lord. I didn't know a whole lot about it. But when I gave my heart to him, something happened inside that had never stopped happening since. And it's just gone on and on and on. The more I study the Bible, the more I find out it's going to go on for eternity. There's no end to it. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is of me, bless his holy name. You know, when you stop and think about it, if you just if you never got anything on this earth but salvation, you'd have enough to praise Jesus for for all of eternity, wouldn't you? If he never gave you another blessing, if he never gave you another experience, that'd be enough to last you for eternity, wouldn't it? But he's better than that. He just he, he just seems to outdo himself. And salvation's only the beginning of good blessings he has for us. If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, that's what you need to do. You say, well, I think I have. I must have. You know, I'm not a heathen exactly. I, you know, I'm not real good, but I'm not real bad either. I'm just sort of in between. You are. But when it comes to salvation, you're either in or you're out. Have you ever asked Jesus to come in your heart? You say, well, I guess so. Maybe so. Hope so. Must have. Well, you need, you need something better than that. You need to know that you have. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never asked him in your heart, you're not sure about it, why don't you just fix the devil's clock right now and just say, Well, okay. If I've never really asked the Lord in my heart, I'm going to ask him right now, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me from all my sins. Now, if you do that and mean it, he'll come in your heart. If he's already there, he'll tell you why you're confused. Now, if that doesn't clear up the problems that you have about salvation and being sure of the Lord, then by all means, come forward. Tell one of the workers who will be at the front, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. And they'll, they'll work or sit down with you with the Word of God. Go over God's plan of salvation and see if that's what you're resting on. If it is, then you can know for sure that Jesus is in your heart. If you're not resting on God's plan of salvation, you can rest on it tonight and be saved. Either way, you're going to win, aren't you? I wouldn't go away doubting and fearing and being full of fear. You say, well, I don't want to join church. Oh, you couldn't. I didn't say anything about going to church, have I? You say, oh, well, I don't want to be baptized. Nobody said anything about that. I'm talking about your relationship with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you can't join this church about four or five times a year. We don't even open the doors. We're not looking for members, people. We're, we're trying to get people ready for heaven. We do have members, and, and it is possible to get in here. But uh, right now, I'm talking to you about your relationship with Jesus. Now, if that's not your problem, but you're... Um, you're driven, you're harassed, you're tormented. This is producing compulsive behavior which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress. You're talking about demon activity in your life. And we'd encourage you to come and get help to deliver some evil spirits. Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. And that's why we do it. And we encourage you to come and receive help. 
There are believers here who can help you with this. Another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you're a believer and haven't received this gift, that's what it is. It's just like salvation. You can receive it. It's like you receive salvation. You can receive this gift of tongues. And you can have it. It's for you. You should have it. You need it. Somebody here could share with you and even help you with it and pray for you if you're interested. Another sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There are people here who believe that Jesus heals today and will lay hands on you in Jesus' name and join in prayer for your healing for physical needs tonight. You need help tonight.